thought it was the greatest thrill in the world to be riding a thousand pound animal 35, 40 miles an hour and hitting a little white ball. It's really a disease, Polo is sort of a disease. I never saw somebody getting out of Polo, you know? You always see people coming into Polo, but never saying, oh no, I don't like the game, or I'm going to change it for another one. Polo has always been the game of kings, the jet-set sport, played where palm trees grow and champagne flows. But this image is changing fast. With almost 10,000 players in 35 countries, it is less and less a sport of the rich and increasingly a sport of professionals. The importance of winning the top-level tournaments with prizes of up to $100,000 means that the top players now have to involve themselves with the game almost 365 days a year either playing, practicing, or bringing on new ponies. On a ground almost six times the size of a football field, two teams of four players try to score goals without endangering any other ponies or riders. At high levels, six chuckers are played, each lasting seven and a half minutes and requiring a fresh pony. Allowing for a few reserves, this means that over 50 ponies will be brought to each game. Back in the stables, a top player probably has access to 20 or 30 horses to keep him mounted throughout a season. Every player in the sport is awarded a handicap, expressed as a number of goals, and reviewed each year by a committee of players. The handicaps start at minus two and go up to a maximum of 10 goals. There are only a handful of 10 goal players in the world at any one time. At the moment, there are seven, four of whom are Argentines. To beat 10 goals is a lot of pressure. Sometimes you think that it's too much. But if you think that you are one of the best, you need the pressure to keep you there. My point in polo is really to try to be the best, to win, to make my living out of polo, on top of that, I have a lot of fun. I have all my friends around the game or in the game. I've been born with polo. For nine years, I arrived at the end of the year without anything. Now it's beginning to pay. But I'm 40 years old, and maybe I'm on my way down. The only reason I'd really want to be a tango player now would be to be able to sit down when I'm 65 years old and say oh, I was once 10. I'd like to do it for one year and then put me back again. I always wanted to be 10 gold. Uh, when I got to be 10 gold, don't get me wrong, I, it was great, but in the spotlight all the time, you, you can't miss a penalty shot, you can't have a bad game. Uh, every tournament you play in, you've got to be super well mounted to maintain the 10 goals, and it's the pressure. It's just too much. The four positions on the field each have a specific function within the game. Number one has a chiefly offensive role, staying upfield to receive passes and score goals. Number two is the workhorse of the team, picking up passes and supporting the attacks of his own number one, whilst trying to disrupt the plays of the opposing team. Number three is the centre half, turning defence into attack and feeding the ball to his forwards. He will often be the best player on the team, controlling tactics.
finally, number four is the back, playing a steady defensive game, protecting the goal and supporting number three. The best player for this position is the really hard hitter who can send balls way upfield. Watching closely over the game are two umpires who have a tough task spotting the many possible infringements of the rules, often missed by the spectators. In very basic terms, a player following the line of the ball has the right of way. It is a foul to cross between him and the ball. However, by riding off or bumping his horse, an opposing player may spoil his shot or even gain possession of the ball, provided the angle of the bump is not so great as to be dangerous. A player may hook an opponent's stick while he is attempting to strike the ball, provided this is not across his opponent's pony. Alternatively, he can meet the ball from the opposite direction, provided he does not cross the line. The game is played with wooden mallets of varying length and flexibility. The stick must be held in the right hand, even by a left-handed player, and is wielded in four basic directions. All these shots can be angled to give variations. Hit by the best players riding at maybe 35 miles per hour, the ball can reach speeds of up to 120 miles per hour. Tommy Wayman played his first game of polo at the age of six, encouraged by his father, who was also a top player. As a teenager, he turned to rodeo, but came back to polo, saying it was just as exciting, but lasted 10 times longer. He achieved the 10 goal rating in 1983, the first American to do so since 1951. Probably the most important thing to me is the horses. I really enjoy it making the horses perform to their maximum. You have to think about the mental state, keeping his mind right, because you're asking him to go wide open, stop and turn, run into another horse. At the same time, you're swinging a stick off of him, and a lot of times they fatigue or they just quit. They just throw in the towel. The first time a racehorse's feet hit the ground, there's three times his body weight on the front two feet. How many times does a polo pony do that in a chucker? A cutting horse will cut a cow for a maximum of two minutes. And we're asking this horse to do what that horse does for seven and a half minutes. So to me, the polo pony has got to be the greatest animal athlete in the world. I like horses that are 15 hands to 15 two, short back, a long neck, pretty head, a short cannonball, very important, uh, good feet, uh, a long hip, uh, and strong. Nice, kindly, decent horse. Don't make it in the ring. Each horse is different, so a player has to have a game plan and an individual plan for each chucker you have to really concentrate on what horse you're riding, hey, what chucker. What color, y'all? And you know what your opponent's going to be riding. So you'll try to put your strong horses against their strong horses, your weaker horses against their weaker horses. Come off and call anything. <laughs> Good luck, Tommy. Okay. You can't just go to the beach. You've got to watch the competition all the time. Never play their game. Try to get them playing your game. A lot of polo ponies go to the left much better than they go to the right. So you see a player that's having problems getting to the right, 
you put all the balls to the right. Every position needs a special kind of horse. Number two needs a very quick off the mark, very handy, short burst of speed. I have to have a horse that's very light in the mouth because I'll get into a play and if a horse is not quick and I can't get out, I'll get run over. You just want them to where you can take two fingers. In. Because when you're going wide open, it's going to take more than that. But if they're schooled to lightness, then you've got it. And just People are born with it. They've either got it or they don't. Once you see that they have it, then you have to protect it. Don't be severe with them, but don't baby them either. There's a happy medium. We put halters on the babies and we play with them a little bit. It makes it easier the older they get to, to handle them. It takes a lot of time, three years, four years, actually five years before you have anything really good enough to take to Palm Beach. I've taken the very best mares that I've played that I know that are good, and I'm trying to cross it with the best stallions. 99.9 Kiss FM and don't call it love. Don't call me either. <laughs> Not at this time. Where the nose goes, the ass has got to follow. She's natural. A, a natural makes a, a, a horse trainer out of a lot of people. You know. Patience is the biggest thing. You might have to ride the horse 15, 20, 30 minutes to get him prepared mentally down or mentally fatigued to where he will train. Then when he becomes too tired, you have to quit because a fresh horse won't learn and a tired horse won't learn. If you have maybe five to eight minutes a day that you can really school a horse. Once you catch it, you never get rid of it. You've got the disease forever. Come on, who's a good guy? I'm always looking for horses. It's actually very difficult to find an extraordinary polar pony. Julian Hipwood learned his polo in the Pony Club, along with his younger brother, Howard. His natural ability was so remarkable that he gave up his ambitions to be a professional footballer and has played polo for England since 1971. I was always told the best type of polo pony was a 100-mile-an-hour donkey. In other words, very quiet, but could do 100 miles an hour. Uh, obviously, they have to stop and turn. Usually you get horses that are uh, better to the left than the right, or right to left. But a wonderful one does it naturally both ways. And accelerate so you have tears in your eyes. There are very few about. You could count them on your hand, really. In the States, they're selling horses between twenty and $40,000. Americans don't care what they spend. I don't spend a lot of money. I just started trying to make my own horses. When you get up to a high standard in polo, you realize you're there because of your horses. 
The horses are probably 75-80% of the game. They all have character. I've had the horses that have nothing about them that I like. And yet I have some that I love. It's because they have those you know, little things that they do. They're like little people. Howard is a lot bigger, a lot stronger, a lot more physical. Howard? Hits the ball. You wouldn't want to get in the way of one of the balls he hits. I am a little bit quieter. Maybe I cut plays more than Howard. We used to play very well together, but now we're usually battling against each other. In the States, it's a very competitive, will-to-win game. I prefer it here, the good fun of the game. What do you want us to do, Governor? Win. A lot of people come off that polar field absolutely thrilled. Not because they won or they lost, because they're still alive. <laughs> well, is that what we did to you last time? They're thrilled that they've given somebody a good bump or hooked somebody's stick. The thrill of sitting on a horse, hitting a ball, galloping flat out round the field, is unbeatable. It's just, just that wonderful feeling. It's rather like motorbikes. I just like the wind in my face. I like the feeling of speed. Uh, a motorbike is a mechanical thing. But now we have a, an animal that has a brain, has these four legs going all over the place, and has a, you know, they don't all stop the same. The brakes, you know, sometimes you can't reline them on a horse. There are so many little things that happen out there on the polo ground, uh, amusing things or really infuriating things, that everybody afterwards they meet in the bar, they talk about those things, and there's, there's a lot of leg pulling that goes on. Argentina produces more players and more ponies than any other country. Horses here are still bred in thousands and used to work the cattle, which provides an excellent training for the skills required on the polo field. Argentina is sort of behind other countries, but that is very good for polo because you can still use a horse that in, you know, I hear that in Australia and places like that they're using motorbikes. Gonzalo Pérez, the youngest of four polo-playing brothers, has been riding since he was three years old. Like so many top players, he depends on buying and selling polo ponies. It doesn't cost more to breed a polo pony than uh, just to raise any horse in your farm. The labor is not very expensive, you know. That helps a lot. <coughs> the breeding of polo horses here is nearly 90% thoroughbred. The good mixture is a little bit of quarter horse or horse that is very good to work the cattle. They don't need to be just built to run like a thoroughbred. You have to find the type to stop quicker than normal. 
not very tall because that way you don't miss a ball. <laughs> Athletic ability of the horse, and that is the name of the game. I buy my horses when they are around six years old. They played maybe two seasons. I should spend 100% of my free time looking for horses to try to maintain your hand here. You have to maintain the level of horses. That is really the secret. You get very close to some ponies, but you need to sell them so you make your living. We are four brothers. The four, we play polo. Since we are 10 years old, we think in polo, we dream at night and polo. Fanatic, you know? My cousins play polo, all the friends of the family. Argentina has close to 4,000 players because here it's very easy to play polo. The basis of why there are so many good players here is there are hundreds of young children that they already played a lot of polo. Seventy percent of the good players, they have another top player in the family. I think it keeps families together, and that's one of the things I love about it, that uh, they have one interest, and then we all go the same place, and we sort of all have the same friends. Most of these are my sister's sons and my brother's sons. There's one of my brothers here, actually. He is 68, and he's still playing with his grandsons. The main reason I play polo is because I love horses. The horse is more important than the sport itself. But when you start competing as uh, seriously as we are doing now in, in all over the world, I think you have to, to be a good polo player, you have to forget about the horse for the seven minutes you're on it. Argentina, I don't think there is one actually that plays polo. You cannot live the way that women like to live, you know, sort of clean. I think it's a question of a costume. But the male dominance of the sport is a comparatively recent aspect of polo. Mentioned in manuscripts as early as 600 BC, it is the oldest known ball game. Polo originated somewhere on the plains of Persia, and was first played on tiny Manipuri ponies by men and women alike. Spreading through China and Mongolia, and then down to Tibet and India, polo acquired its modern name from the word pulu, the willow root from which the ball was made. In the 1850s, British cavalry officers first encountered the game in India and were so enthusiastic that they brought it home when on leave. The first match in England was played in 1869 on Hounslow Heath, with eight players on each side. And such was the popularity of the game that it was even played by night. In 1876, James Gordon Bennett took polo to America and it has never looked back. Once it had spread south, it did not take long for the Argentines, capitalizing on their flat, open plains and handy native ponies to become the foremost players and breeders of ponies in the world, exporting both their own skills and those of their mounts with great success. However, following the Falklands War, Argentine players and ponies were banned from England for several years. England, it was a place that we were sort of fanatic to go. 
everybody likes a game and they love horses. Uh, you play, if, even if it rains, you play. It has a lot of uh, character. Polo in this country has definitely deteriorated since the Argentines have not been playing here. I mean, it, you imagine cricket without the West Indies. The Argentines are the best polo players in the world. I played with the father. We heard you fled out of bedroom window. Cricket's underway, you'll be in everybody's way, so please back to your seats. Welcome to Wimbledon for the Coronation Cup, England in blue, Mexico in green, and we're in for a big, uh, really big afternoon, I assure you of that. We look at the England side, England, number four, Howard Hipwood, Superman of English Polo without any shadow of a doubt. Some horses are really exceptional, so you have to mark up much tighter to stop them escaping, because once they've gone, they've gone. Also, your teammates must know if you've got somebody in your team that can actually fly on a horse. You try to hit long balls because they've got the speed. Really super horses. They don't actually follow the ball, although it would just take a fingertip touch to make it. It knows that it's maybe going to have to follow the ball. change horses after a chakra, you have to anticipate accordingly. If you jump out of a Ferrari and get into a Mini, you know the difference. Try and pick up Memo a little bit more, Howard, and I'll go for Carlos a bit more, okay? And just okay. keep sending them up, sending them up, oh, yeah. and cover anybody that comes through. Just playing, just playing through. This old man's bloody got him. It's your man. people it's the end of the world if they lose they go home they write letters they cry leave me alone for five minutes and then I'm fine back to normal again it's not like a job but I wouldn't change it for the world is a very dangerous sport. I don't know, quite honestly, why we don't have more uh, accidents. People are galloping around at 30, 40 miles an hour, all at different angles. 
You just need somebody who's a little bit out of control or misjudges. I'd been hit out of the saddle by Tommy Wayman, actually, and uh, I went into a wheelchair for a few weeks. Then on crutches, I was, I was out for two and a half months. I had 50 splinters taken out of my hand. That put me out for four months. I wear a mask because I just don't want to have my face smashed in. In the last three or four years, we've probably lost five or six polar players. It's usually broken necks. It's a dangerous game, both for the horses and the man. I've been unconscious for four or five hours. A lot of stitches. I had 28 stitches here from a polo mallet. I had a lot of accidents, but really serious was the horse went over me flat out. If the horse will catch you before you get you hit the ground, uh, that will make you whip with the head or will land on top of your head the horse. Then it's really bad. You get injuries all the time. <laughs> Quite so hard, eh? It's no good worrying about them. Broken collarbone, broken cheekbone, <laughs> broken. Uh, I cracked my jawbone about two years ago. But, you know, they all, all these things, I mean, at the time, it's, it's a pain, <laughs> literally, but it's also a nuisance because you're laid off. Acknowledged as the fastest game in the world after ice hockey, polo, not surprisingly, takes its toll on the ponies as well as the players. Apart from the inevitable cuts and bruises from flying mallets, the backbone and pelvis can sometimes be put out by the sharp stops and turns and violent ride-offs. Those bones should be absolutely in a straight line like that. And where they've subluxated, either one way or the other, then I'm straightening them out. That's what they should do, too. Because if they're wrong, you can't lift that tail up. They clamp it down. Claire Tomlinson has the highest handicap ever attained by a woman. Her father helped to revive post-war polo in England and Claire now pursues it with extraordinary dedication, breeding and training more ponies than anyone else in England. Claire Tomlinson, well, you don't give her much at all because she's too good for that. She'll give it to you. You treat her as a, <laughs> as a boy, really. The first time I played against Claire, I didn't know the lady, I didn't, you know, I didn't want to be rude or, or bump hard or anything like that. And the next thing I know, boy, she about knocked me down. I said, you're going to have to pay attention to what's going on here. This lady's going to play polo. Some men will really try to rough you up, especially in England. The Argentines are always very polite. But you see, the better the player, the less they need to be rough. The more agile that you can make your horse, it is a continuation of your body. You've got to put your horse within half an inch, an inch, of where you want him to hit the correct shot. It's rather like approaching a fence. You have to get the stride. You want it to be lifting its legs up as you start to hit the ball. Polar ponies, the good ones, love the game. There is absolutely no question about it. You can feel that their heart is totally in it. There's an incredible shortage of polo ponies. So we breed them and bring them on with the aim that they're going to play polo. Above all, I try to handle them in a way where they trust the person who's handling them. And this means usually that you get a quiet horse that's not going to object when you do something new. I sit with them when they're a year and a bit, and I back them when they're three. I think if you take each pony at their own speed, there's no reason why they shouldn't all play polo. Yes, good girl. 
There's a good girl. I don't like any horse that kicks, or I don't think there's any excuse for that, really. There's a good girl. Hey. But I mean, when she gets going, she's not a donkey. Once they're six, they've got to go and earn their oats. If they learn to shy away from other horses, then they're always going to do it. You can't actually get them to ride off properly until they answer to the leg, move away from the leg. You have to be on the verge of doing a half pass. Hopefully, by the time my ponies play properly, they can do a half pass. Don't let her jack out. Go, no, don't let her do that. She mustn't learn to do that. Come on, come on, push her on. Give her one down the backside. Come on, push her on. Faster. That's it. Well done. I usually make about seven or eight polar ponies every year. That's a good job. Time well, is the thing. Once you try to hurry it, come on. Come on, that's when on. the ponies go wrong. Come on. Come on. No, wrong leg. Come on. There's a good girl. Come on. In Argentina, they tend to handle their horses much later. The time spent in the early stages nil, and they try to condense the breaking in time. In Argentina, they want them to buck. Their idea is that they've got to break the horse's spirit. They have to conquer the horse. And uh, some of the methods are cruel, but it seems to work for them. You know, they get some very good horses. As interest in the sport increases, so do the pressures on the top players. Often under contract to a commercial sponsor or a private patron, they travel around the world following the sun, playing for 11 and a half months a year in four or five different countries. You kind of lose your sense of reality because you're always moving and three months here, two months there, and I'd like to stay at home sometimes.
it's a lot tougher in America. The grounds are better, faster, and they spend more money on their horses, so it gets a lot more sort of brutal, harder ride-offs. Gonzalo Pires, you could die when I say this, but he's one of those players that doesn't bother to get out of bed until 12 o'clock. And he's one of the lucky guys who's just a natural. He can do anything and then just turn up and be brilliant. He just has it in his blood. Very, very quick. Anticipation is incredible. When you play against Gonzalo, He's mounted so well, he doesn't have a weak chucker. He's got six very strong horses. So what you have to do, one player on your team has to get control of him, try to eliminate him before he ever gets to the ball. Don't ever let him get to the ball. Then the best ability that I have is that I don't take too long to feel comfortable on any horse. Some people really do mind changing from one to another. I don't think you have to post it that they move the same in the whole world. You should be able to adjust to the horse in maybe one minute of the chakra. You cannot take longer than that because the game is over. The Hippol brothers, the higher the polo is, the better that the play. In England, they don't play as much high gold polo. And I imagine that they got this ability as dream. Julian ducks his head and goes through people. Howard it really hits the ball hard. Neither one of them like to turn on the ball or tap the ball. They like to play a fast running game. So what you try to do is slow the game down. They're both really top players. <laughs> Tommy Wayman getting the first score of that afternoon match. And it's now Ratama, Southern Hills. Tommy Wayman, he likes sitting with the boys, chewing his tobacco and spitting with a can of beer in his hand, and to play polo with the people he likes. He has a very good reputation of making horses. Wonderful striking ability. He has one of the best eyes you can find in polo. He's very good to hit the ball in the air. If the ground is bouncy, it's no different for him. He's always very well mounted. The best way to play against him is to try to play a very open game. He's one of the quickest in the game. You know, you never, ever play the perfect game. You've got to make a mistake somewhere. I think the reason I got better was because of the horses. I was able to make enough top horses to keep me a step ahead of the people that I was playing against. Well, horses play six months of the year, but no more than three months at a time. They last much longer than that. There are players, if they've got a good horse, they'll play at two chuckers in every game, two chuckers, two chuckers. Well, if a horse has got a thousand chuckers in him over a 10 year period, you're cutting his lifespan in half. So I don't like to double up on my horses unless I just really have to. And, uh, which maybe once a year I'll play a horse twice and that's all. And my horses last longer. I've got horses that I'm playing now that are they have been playing high goal polo under me for six, seven years. Come on, Tommy. Well hit, Mikey! Well done! Come on, boys! Come on! Stop being a hot dog, damn it. One minute? Come on, Tommy! No, left. Left. Oh, he's a number 10 goal player. What a beautiful match.
Look at that. Get the car. Get the car. Get the car. Get the car. Well done, Mike. I can't believe how many times we've been to this thing and we've never done it. Uh, I love that. I love the miniature one. The press have built us into sort of jet set macho men that earn millions and millions or thousands and thousands. In actual fact, our our life is is is, is a way of life. I never feel it as a social thing. For us, really, all the uh, champagne and all those things, and, you know, we take it as uh, something normal. There's some people that come to polo games not to watch the game, but just to be seen. But to each his own. The high society image of polo doesn't uh, affect me that much because it's a living to me. Polo is something increase, and increase here in Argentina. It's growing in the United States. I haven't been in England lately, but I imagine that will be growing there. It's growing in Brazil, growing in all uh, South and North America. It's even they're playing polo in Asia. In the whole world, I think the polo is growing. Polo is changing. Before it used to be more a game to play between friends. I think now that you have to play to win. The speed they go at now is out of this world. Polo has done nothing but go up for the last five years. I don't know what's going to happen. I have no idea. Things are happening too fast for me. It's just grown by leaps and bounds. It's just incredible. I would think that the golden days of polo are now maybe just beginning. <laughs>